the area designation on the future land use map from the low density area to the existing development area. The second item is change of zone uh, number 1959 filed on behalf of Charles E. Turner, Jr. This is an ordinance to amend the comprehensive zoning map of Sussex County from an AR1 agricultural residential district to an MR medium residential district for the same parcel of land previously described, lying and being in Georgetown 100, Sussex County, containing 9.72 acres, more or less. Submitted into the record for the change of zone, we have a copy of the plus comments, we have a copy of the staff analysis, we have a copy of the DELDOT service level evaluation response, we have a copy of the applicant's exhibits and the applicant's proposed findings. We have a copy of a letter received from Artesian Resources. And we have a copy of a letter received from the Sussex County Engineering Department Utility Planning Division. I would note for CZ 1959, we've received zero comments. The third application is conditional use number 2320, also filed on behalf of Charles E. Turner. This is an ordinance to grant a conditional use of land in an MR medium density residential district for multifamily dwellings, 42 units to be located on a certain parcel of land lying and being in Georgetown 100, Sussex County, containing 9.72 acres, more or less, located at the same address as previously described. All three, and submitted into the record for the conditional use application, we have a copy of the plus comments, a copy of the DELDOT service level evaluation response, a copy of the staff analysis, a copy of the applicant's exhibits, a copy of the applicant's proposed findings of fact and conditions of approval. We have a copy of the deed for the property. We have a copy of the conceptual site plan for the property. We have a copy of comments that have been received from DENREC, Division of Watershed Stewardship. We have a letter from Artesian Resources. We have a letter received from the Sussex County Engineering Department, Utility Planning Division. And I would note we've received zero comments. All three applications, Mr. President, were heard before the Planning and Zoning Commission at its meeting of December 8th of last year. And at the meeting of January 12th of this year, the Commission recommended denial of the three applications. Specifically, they recommended for the seven reasons for Ordinance 2208 and for the five reasons as stated for CZ 1959 and for the three reasons as stated for CU 2320. And Mr. President, copies of all three of those motions and copies of the draft minutes of both of those meetings are included in your paperless packet for all three items. Thank you. Any questions from council? I actually do. Go ahead. Just have a real simple one. Did, I, did you say you have no correspondence in opposition or in, op, or in favor? Not on the file that I can see for either. Zero, zero, and zero. So. I had one that was submitted, but they said they submitted it also to the clerk. So. In favor or opposition? Opposition. We can include that in the packet. I didn't see it on the file, so that's... Absolutely, that's included in the record if it's received, Mr. President, sir. I, I don't have a copy of the Artesian letter. Yep. Um, can you tell me what that says? I can locate that. And I believe it was in the applicant's exhibits. So. Hmm. And in the interest of, of time, Mr. President, I can circulate that while, while the applicant's presenting, sir. So. Okay. Ms. P. I have that letter, too. I can submit it. Actually, I'll just submit it as part of my presentation. Just give me one second. It's a lot of information. Yes. It's just the will serve letter. Is it a one-pager? copy of it, but I also have a set of documents I'm submitting that I'll address as part of my presentation. I'm just giving them to Director Whitehouse now. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, for the record, my name is Mackenzie P, and I'm an attorney at the law firm of Baird, Mandalas, Brockstead, Federico, and Cordea, LLC, and I'm here on behalf of applicant owner Charles Turner. Mr. Turner is present this afternoon, um, should the council have any questions. In light of the Commission's recommendation for denial of all three applications, I intend to present each application in a, con in a consolidated but detailed um, manner. Um, in addition to reviewing the Commission's decision that was inconsistent with the record made below and included reasons in support of its decision that were factually inaccurate and misstated what the Sussex County Comprehensive Plan actually says. We had a transcript prepared of Commissioner Hoey Stevenson's motion to recommend denial seconded by Commissioner Wingate and recommended for denial 4-0 to zero by Commissioner Hoey-Stevenson, Commissioner Wingate, Commissioner Hopkins, Chairman Wheatley, with Commissioner Mears absent. So I submitted uh, the copy of that transcript into the record, a copy of the decision, as well as a copy of 
the transcript from the hearing decision below, and a notated and highlighted section of Section 4-16 of the Comprehensive Plan in the Future Land Use Chapter that concerns the existing development area of Future Land Use Classification that I'll refer to. Go ahead. The applicant has three requests, including Ordinance 22-08 for a future land use map amendment from low density to existing development area, CZ 1959 to rezone the property from AR1 to MR, and CU 2320 for a conditional use of land for the development of 42 multifamily units. So the existing property is a 9.72 acre parcel, and it's the present location of the Silver Oaks Bubble Home Park located at parcel number 135-11-65 and off of Route 9 in Georgetown, Delaware, near the intersection of Route 9 and Gravel Hill Road specifically. The properties adjacent to the Hawthorne development and specifically to that community's open space uh, to the rear um, and side yard portion, there's also the presence of a tax ditch that's shown on the plan. On the other side of the property is a property that was subject to a conditional use where the Burns Pet Store um, was previously located and then relocated uh, towards Lewis um, on Route 9. And then across the street are residential homes and a property that's owned by Two Farms, Inc., Royals Farm. Uh, Royal Farms entity, excuse me, that was rezoned from AR1 to B1 for future retail is my understanding. So the existing Silver Oaks Trailer Park was established on April 6, 1966, as confirmed by a notice that's included in your um, packet of information, specifically as Exhibit B. And I misspoke on the record below when I was providing information and referencing um, this notice, so I want to clarify and explain what that actually states and what the purpose is. So the purpose of that notice was to inform the then Planning and Zoning Commission of the existing Silver Oak Mobile Home Park that had 38 mobile home lots approved, that 21 of the lots had actually been occupied as of 1970, and that the Board of Adjustment had historically approved an expansion of the park by eight additional lots. Today, there are 11 mobile home lots on site, and all of the existing mobile home owners leasing land have been notified of Mr. Turner's intention to develop the site, and that notice was um, particularly prepared and sent out um, by Mr. Um, Turner's, um, an another attorney. The applicant, as stated, submitted a number of documents into the record. I won't repeat um, what uh, Director Whitehouse just stated, but they're all before you. If you have any questions about any of them, I'm happy to answer them. The property is zoned AR1 currently. Properties adjacent to the site are also zoned AR1. Properties across the street are zoned AR1 and B1, and then there's a number of other properties um, past the intersection of Route 9 and Route 30 that are zoned uh, largely commercial, um, you have business, um, as well as CR1, uh, with future land use designations of low density area, commercial, developing area, industrial, and existing development area. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. sure. I don't mean to interrupt you. What's parcel 66 zone next door, the subdivision? The subdivision zoned AR1, so, and I'll address that specifically um, as a cluster subdivision. So the project's also located in investment level four according to the state strategies for state policy and spending map. The cabinet committee, as you know, on state planning issues through the Office of State Planning Coordination developed the first Delaware strategies for state policies and spending maps in 1999 to be updated every five years with the most recent update in 2020. So as council understands, the state strategies were designed to help the committee guide state investment decisions and serve as a framework for coordinating plans and actions of local government. Chapter four of the comprehensive plan explains that state strategies for state policies and spending map classifies four different investment level areas. And that the four investment levels clarify the state's policies and pr priorities for the expenditure of state funds on infrastructure. As the comprehensive plan states, this, that policy and the spending map are not parcel based and they're not a land use plan. It may be true that the state does not prioritize funding in that less investment level, but that does not mean development cannot take place in the classification levels as we've obviously seen in Sussex County. So I'll address each application um, next. In terms of the future land use map amendment, I intend to summarize the request and then defer to um, Director Whitehouse if there's any additional information that needs to be added um, to this specific um, application. So the property is presently classified as a low density area on the future land use map. 
the low density area is considered to be a rural area. As of 2018, all lands designated as low density area are also zoned AR1. AR1, B2, C2, M, I1, and new zoning districts are considered to be consistent in that, in that designation and classification. Section 4.4.3 of the plan details the permitted uses envisioned in that area. Those uses include agricultural and residential uses, as well as development that is largely confined to businesses addressing the needs of agricultural and residential uses. Ordinance 22-08 seeks to amend the future land use map from low density to an existing development area, a growth area. And obviously, this is really the contention with this entire project. Um, so I, I really do want to go through everything, go through the decision, and then answer questions at the end about um, our argument. Uh, so chapter four of the comprehensive plan explains that the existing development area consists primarily of existing residential development under current general residential and medium density residential zoning districts, as well as some commercial uses. These areas are scattered throughout the county and are surrounded by low density areas. The land use history of the property is relevant and extremely important um, when making this consideration and decision in that this property was permitted as a mobile home park and approved for 38 mobile home lots as stated. Therefore, this property has been in existing residential development since 1966. It is our position that the property should have been designated as an existing development area because of its past and current use. The existing development area permits a full range of housing types, including single-family homes, townhomes, and multifamily units like the proposed development. Non-residential developments consist of uses found in the neighborhood business districts and commercial districts, which is relevant considering the properties zoned C1 and commercial uh, right near the site. The existing and proposed uses are consistent with the permitted uses in the existing development area as an existing mobile home development and a proposed multifamily development. There are also existing development areas in the vicinity of the site towards the intersection of Route 5 and 9, and there you'll find the operation of existing commercial business, the rail farms, and existing residential developments. Infrastructure, including central water and sewer, are strongly encouraged in this area. As mentioned, Hawthorne, adjacent to the site, um, is developed out. Artesian has submitted. We submitted that will serve letter, which now um, before you all as well. There are um, the central water and sewers available to the site. And finally, the applicable zoning district in the existing development area included in MR and GR as well as some commercial areas, meaning the intended development in an MR district would be considered consistent with the underlying classification of existing development area if the future land use map amendment was granted. The application was also presented to PLUS on December 21, 2022, and the applicant responded, and specifically the applicant's engineer, to each comment on January 23, 2023. So in that comment, the state noted specifically that rezonings and development applications have increased along Route 9, and that's true. Um, but they state that the cumulative effects of continuing to review and approve rezonings and land use development proposals outside of planned growth areas will have long-term negative impacts on the state and county, both fiscally and environmentally, because infrastructure and services to support these developments are not planned for the areas. This comment suggests that the state is making a more general comment about development and investment level four areas, something that takes place in Sussex County all of the time, rather than a project specific comment in light of the fact that the property is near commercial and residential developments and has access to existing infrastructure as stated. So if, before I move on to the rezoning request, I don't know if Director Whitehouse has anything to add with respect to the future land use amendment. Only in relation to the PLUS process. So the conditional use application and the change of zone application, it is correct that they have been through the PLUS process. That's correct. The future land use map amendment, though, however, would need to go back through the PLUS process. And that's included on the first page of your memo for mm -hmm. Ordinance 2208. So. Okay. Thank you. So the applicant's second request is change of zone 1959 to rezone the property from AR1 to MR to ultimately develop 42 multifamily units, only four more units than what has historically existed on site. The MR district provides for medium density residential development in areas which are or are expected to become generally urban in character where sanitary sewer and public water supplies may or may not be available at the time of construction together with churches and recreational facilities and accessory uses as may be necessary or are normally compatible with residential surroundings. 
It is true that AR1 permits low-density multifamily units through the pursuit of a conditional use, but the applicant seeks this rezoning change in MR, which permits medium-density residential to allow for the development of 14, 42 multifamily units at a density of 4.36 units per acre. The proposed rezoning is compatible with surrounding uses with a mix of residential, business, and commercial along a developing Route 9, which is stated in the comprehensive plan is possible to develop, and it is developing as a business corridor with a mix of residential and commercial uses. Significantly, there are other residential uses that are very similar to what's being proposed, um, even at a higher density, including Weston Willow's apartment complex. So for the record, that's 287-unit apartment complex on 27 acres, built at a much higher density, closer to 12 units per acre, just a mile west of the parcel. Azalea Woods, Hawthorne Development, Win Winford Preserve, which was just recently approved for another um, 100 um, single-family lots back on this site here, and Deerwood Subdivision as well. So Table 2 for height, area, and bulk requirements for multifamily structures confirms that multi-units in MR and C1 districts are subject to the same height, area, and bulk requirements, which permit the same density of 4 to 12 units per acre as shown on that table. And again, this is relevant considering all of the commercial that exists in that Weston um, Willows complex um, to the west of the site. As noted in the Planning and Zoning Office's memorandum, there's been three change of zones within a mile radius of the site. So CZ 1838 from AR1 to B1 for the two, two farms property that's located um, diagonally. There's also CZ 1902 CR1 to um, HI1. That applicant noted um, on the record was where uh, McGee Plumbing, AP Kroll Sons, and Peninsula Plaving um, there's Route 9 Industrial Center. There's the Gravel Hill Dell Dot Yard. Obviously, all more intensive uses than the use proposed. And then the final third use was CZ 1944 that amended an AR1 district to a C2 district for the executive lawn property management to expand um, its land use, landscaping business. Um, the planning and zoning memorandum also concludes that the intended development could be considered, and I would say is consistent with surrounding land uses. And finally, Table 4.5-2, titled Zoning Districts Applicable to Future Land Use Categories, confirms that MR is an applicable district in the existing development area. Moving on to the final request, and then I'll address the decision specifically below. The applicant's final request is Conditional Use 2320. For a conditional use of land in MR for the development of 42 multifamily units on the property, that, of course, is subject to the approval of the future land use map as well as the rezoning requests. The purpose of Section 115-171 on conditional uses states that it is to provide for certain uses which cannot be well adjusted to their environment, in particular locations, with full protection offered to surrounding properties by rigid application of the district regulations. <coughs> These uses are generally of a public or semi-public character, and are essential and de desirable for the general convenience and welfare. But because of the nature of the use, the importance of the relationship to the comprehensive plan, and possible impact not only on neighboring properties but on a large section of the county, require the exercise of planning judgment on location and site plan. The proposed multifamily development will be accessed off Route 9 as shown on the site plan. The proposed density for the development is 4.36 dwelling units per acre, as stated, and that would be permitted subject to um, a rezoning and future land use map and specific rezoning to MR. There are a total of eight buildings proposed, with each building containing three to six units each, a community building and pool amenity, and 6.43 acres, or 66.7 percent of the site proposed as open space subject to final site engineering. That is really significant because adjacent developments developed as single family homes would be required per code, and specifically Hawthorne, under the AR1 district to meet 30 percent open space requirement in, in cluster subdivision. So this plan is proposing more than double the required open space of adjacent residential developments, which is more than keeping in character with surrounding uses. And parking exceeds the code requirements as well, which is for 84 spaces. It actually proposes 92 spaces. There are non-tidal wetlands um, that are located primarily where the tax ditch is located, um, and they will remain undisturbed as the plan reflects. 
and the developer has submitted a court order change to reduce the um, tax ditch right away as that's also included in the record. In terms of stormwater management, a combination of wet ponds, planted buffers, and infiltration practices will be used for stormwater treatment and discharge in accordance with state and county standards. Potable water, as I've stated uh, multiple times now, will be provided um, by artesian and sewers anticipated to be served by the same. The increase in traffic effect on surrounding roadways will be analyzed, reviewed, and approved by DelDOT. As DelDOT's response to the applicant's service level request form states, the developer's traffic impact is considered to be negligible. As noted also in the applicant's response to PLUS comments, the developer will work with DelDOT to develop an entrance plan in accordance with applicable standards and also intends to eliminate one existing entrance and provide a continuation of the shared use path from the Hawthorne development. And that's really important because in the plan itself, it talks about a goal of making Route 9 multimodal and about reducing the number of uh, unnecessary entrances to a site. So again, we're accomplishing another goal of the plan um, with those improvements. The developer also intends to work with DART to provide the requested shelter pad and bus pull-off area as well. Section 115-31 of the code um, concerning multifamily dwelling structures states that they may be permitted as conditional uses subject to the provisions of the site plan requirements. The proposed use is in compliance with the multifamily requirements of the code and the height area and bulk requirements of Table 2 as shown on the site plan. If the future land use map amendment and rezoning is adopted, then the proposed use will be in compliance with the comprehensive plan update. The final um, portion of my presentation concerns the decision below. So on December 8, 2022, the commissioners heard these applications for the first time. And at the December 8 meeting, there were three commissioners present. Chairman Wheatley, Commissioner Hopkins, and Commissioner Mears, with Commissioner Hoey Stevenson and Commissioner Wingate absent. None of the commissioners present asked any questions at the conclusion of the presentation to the applicant specifically that would have even remotely suggested a recommendation for denial was forthcoming. There was no opposition. It was a complete and total surprise that there was a recommendation four to zero for denial. To the contrary, the record below suggests that the commission considered that this property may have been missed as a property that should have been appropriately classified as an existing development area. Specifically, during the discussion of the three applications, Commissioner Hopkins asked staff a rhetorical question trying to figure out why this property as an existing development was not designated as GR to match what was there. And then Chairman Wheatley said that he had the same question and specifically said, quote, and this is in the documents we handed in today, since the 60s there has been an approval in for 38 units. You would have thought someone might have noticed that, but apparently we did not, end quote. And then in response, Commissioner Hopkins states, quote, and we see this happen more in your neck of, wood, neck of the woods, addressing this comment to Chairman Wheatley, where this, all these, and I'm quoting, excuse me, um, if you look at the zoning map, there's all these oddball GR spots that don't seem to tie in with anything, but then because there have been manufactured home parks or whatever, there have been there forever, and they established them from day one as GR zoning, it's, you know, just interesting why this one never was. End quote. Commissioner Hopkins even goes on to say that this property seems like an outlier. End quote. We would agree that it is an outlier, and it's an outlier because the property should have been classified as an existing development area for all the reasons stated below and here today, and should not have been designated as a low density area or zoned Air One. On January 12, Commissioner Hoey Stevenson motioned to deny the future land use map amendment, a domino effect that resulted in the other um, applications um, being recommended for denial as well. So I'd like to take a moment and walk through her um, motion specifically and the reasons stated in support of that recommendation for denial. As I work through her motion, I'd ask that you refer back to that um, attachment um, and section from the code that's highlighted. So in the motion, um, Commissioner Hoey Stevenson states, and I quote, the existing development area is designated in the comprehensive plan for existing residential development under the current general residential and medium residential zoning districts, as well as some commercial uses, end quote. What page are you on? Sure. So I'm on the um, first page, this first page, okay. yep. And of the, I can be more specific. So the first page. Her comments? 
Yep, and I'll, I'll reference you to the... On page mm -hmm. 878. So if you start on, it would be the January 12, 2023 um, transcript specifically. It's on the second page where she begins her motion. And it's at the bottom specifically. So she states, so bottom of page two, part two that's labeled two, the existing development area there. So she states, the existing development area is designated in the comprehensive plan for existing residential development under the current general residential and medium residential zoning districts, as well as some commercial uses, end quote. And that's undisputed. Um, we agree with that. Um, the commissioner goes on to say, and I quote, um, this is on the top of the next page, the plan further states that this um, particular classification is simply being used to identify these existing scattered zoning areas that have no direct relationship to their surrounding zoning and or future land use map, end quote. This is also true. The comprehensive plan states the existing development areas are scattered and are surrounded by low density areas. Significantly, this description of existing development areas is consistent with the Silver Oaks Trailer Park use for reasons stated. The commissioner continues stating, quote, on the next paragraph there, um, on, the, on the third page, the plan emphasizes that this area should only emphasize added, emphasis added on the commissioner's use of the word only, be used for existing GR and MR zone properties, end quote. And this misquotes the plan. So if you refer back to what the plan actually says, the plan as written plainly states that the existing development area consists primarily Emphasis on the word primarily, not only, of existing residential development under current GR and MR zoning districts, as well as some commercial uses. So to be clear, the existing development area is not only used for GR and MR zone properties. As directly quoted in the plan, the existing development area primarily includes existing residential developments under current GR and MR zoning districts, as well as commercial uses. So the reasons in support of the motion continue to rely on this misquoted section of the plan. In fact, the commissioner goes on to say that the comprehensive plan also reiterates the existing development area is limited to existing GR and MR land by providing that there is no intention to expand this land use classification. So it may be true that there is no intention to expand this land use classification, but there's no prohibition against expanding this classification, especially when it appears that this property should have been classified as an existing development area based on its use historically since 1966. The commissioner adds, quote, there is no dispute that the property is currently developed as a small manufactured home park that has been in existence for decades. However, it is situated upon land that is zoned AR1 and it was never rezoned to GR. So to be clear, the property could not be rezoned to GR without a future land use map amendment like the one that is before you and a rezoning request. So perhaps the commission the commissioner was referring to the fact that the planning commission back in the 1970s didn't designate this as a GR district. I'm not sure. It's not clear from the record below. The commissioner, though, emphasized that the existing mobile home parks a legally non-conforming use as a reason in support of her motion as well. Even if that is true, it does not mean that the property could not be designated as an existing development area as requested. And it also does not mean that it should not have been designated as the same. I would add that when comprehensive planning, part of what one considers is what the current use is, and oftentimes that current use informs and should inform how the property is zoned and how the property is designated in the future land use map. That seems obvious. But it's really important and a consideration um, that should be taken um, um, very significantly um, in your consideration of the applicant's requests. So there's actually a property in a local municipality that comes to mind that does not have a certified comprehensive plan for a related use. So that property is actually the Rehoboth Art League property, which you may or may not be familiar with, in the municipality of Henlopen Acres. And that community had its first comprehensive plan in 2004. It performed its first comprehensive plan review in 2012. The primary reason that plan was not certified concerned the Art League's non-conforming use. The issue was that the Art League wanted to be rezoned to a cultural district from an existing residential district, 
essentially creating a zone, zoning district that would bring the use into compliance with the new zoning district that that existing use would conform to. The town wanted the Art League to remain as a residential use, primarily being concerned about it expanding um, a legally non-conforming use in that existing district. In 2014, Ms. Constance Holland, the then Director of State Planning, confirmed that she could not send the current plan to the Governor with the Art League remaining as a residentially zoned district. Ms. Holland recommended that the Art League property be rezoned because of its current use. Ms. Holland's comments should inform your decision on Mr. Turner's applications and especially the future land use map amendment request. This is an example of the state planning office looking at property and not certifying a comprehensive plan because of, of a municipality's decision to maintain a property zoning district that was inconsistent with the current zoning district in light of the property's past legally non-conforming use. The state's position on the Art League had everything to do with the current and future intended use of the Art League. And because Hemlopen Acres decided to keep the property as a legally non-conforming use zoned residentially and not zoned to a use consistent with its current and intended future use, its plan in part was not certified. Similar, similarly, Mr. Turner's property operates as a legally non-conforming use in an AR1 zoning district and a low density future land use classification. In contrast to the Art League property that was clearly intended to not be rezoned, uh, we're arguing here that it seems that the property has been overlooked uh, when, and was overlooked when designating the property as an AR1 district and low density area. There's nothing in the record to the contrary to suggest that there was any actual intent to leave the property zoned AR1 and to classify the property as low density. It's our position that Mr. Turner's property should have been designated to a classification and zoned in a manner consistent with its past and current use that has operated on the site since 1966. That's almost 60 years. I remind the council that on the record below, Commissioner Hopkins and Chairman Wheatley suggest, suggested that this may have been missed. There is certainly no substantial evidence on the record to the contrary to support the Commission's reasons for denying the future land use map amendment and associated rezoning request and conditional use request. In fact, it's our position that the paper and spoken record overwhelmingly suggests that the property should have been classified as an existing development area. In conclusion, the requested future land use map amendment would correct what appears to be based on the record made below and here today an oversight. In looking at the future land use map amendment request, the applicant encourages this council to review all the materials presented today and take its time in reviewing those materials. And consider the intended use, a 42 unit multifamily unit. That's only four more units than the approved 38 units for a legally non-conforming use that's been there for nearly 60 years. Proposed adjacent to and in the immediate vicinity of other single family and multifamily units as well as other commercial uses with almost 67% of the site designated as open space and with access to public water and sewer on Route 9 that would be consistent with the comprehensive plans direction for possible development of the Route 9 corridor as a business corridor with a mix of residential and commercial uses in addition to contributing to the plan's goal of making Route 9 multimodal and even reducing access points um, from the number of entrances from two to one, another goal of the plan. This intended development will complement Route 9's growth and offer another option for housing for present and future residents who may desire or to not um, purchase a single family home or may not be able to for afford the same. So for all these reasons, the applicant requests that the council approve the future land use map amendment, the requested rezoning from AR1 to MR, and the proposed 42 unit multifamily unit development. So I'll conclude my presentation and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there Thank any you. questions? I, I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The Delta, um, I must have missed it. Mm -hmm. Say how many trips a day this is going to generate. It should be in the service level evaluation request. Just to make sure I read it. Yep, let me pull it. A lot here. There is. I think I read they said it would be negligible. I knew that, yeah. They oftentimes will run, they'll still tell you what the daily anticipated trips are. Yeah, I have it here. It's in there, that says dated February 22nd of 2021. Based on our review, we estimate the above land use will generate fewer than 50 vehicle trips in any hour and Thank fewer you. than 500 vehicle trips per day. An hour. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
Um, in the course of a, a different application, there was uh, came to light that there is apparently an underground plume of mm -hmm. a chemical called uh, TCE. I'm actually really familiar with all Tri of that. Trichloroethylene. Mm -hmm. Is, and, and I see that that's why I'm concerned about artesian green too. But do you see that impacting your development I can, in any way? I can't speak to this specific development, but I'm intimately familiar with Hawthorne and Winford Preserve, which I just tried when Winford Preserve and this issue was addressed. Um, mm -hmm. And so that plume actually originates across the street at the campground. Um, and it is... Um, it originates at the campground? So my understanding is that the, the actual pollution originated at the campground years ago. Mm -hmm. That the TCE is located at a depth... 50, 60 feet. Very, very deep below where we'd actually tap a well. Um, and um, that there are monitoring sites on Hawthorne. There will also be monitoring sites on Win Winford Preserve. They haven't monitored in years, though, have they? So there was... They, so they started to monitor in 2005, and this is from memory. Excuse me if I misspeak. Park, yeah. Yep. Um, there was then um, there are um, welling there are wells drilled on Hawthorne that are uh, I believe there's two um, that are for monitoring and Winford Preserve because this issue is raised on the record it's on Denrex radar um, they have they will have to be monitoring the site and obviously with this particular site Denrex would also if Denrex says so. We could have to obviously monitor here as well. I don't know about the presence of the plume underneath this specific property, though. It seems to be heading that general direction. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea what the concentrations are, or what I the don't. health risk might be? Or? Um, I know that at the Winford Preserve level, there's a there was a. a uh, one of the conditions of approval for the preliminary plan was that we could not um, drill um, any irrigation wells, and that would be, if this was something that could be approved, it would be approved. Um, I think that that would be a good case to look to for an example of a condition that was subject to that approval and that application that limited what you could actually, what wells could, wells, excuse me, could actually be drilled. So. Yeah, that was that was a big question I had. Mm -hmm. So. Anything else? Anyone else? Well, this, the site is going to be serviced by Central Water, right? right. Central Water and Sewer. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not that concerned? Irrigation about wells is primarily where the issue came up at the other site, mm -hmm. and which is where we specifically restricted the ability to, to drill. Okay. Were there any other uh, questions? If not, if you'd like to have a seat. Okay. Is there anyone else here today that would like to speak in favor of this application? Anyone in favor? Is there anyone here today that would like? Hi, my name is Susan Barra. I live in Hawthorne on Emerson Way. And um, I'm not really good with board speaking. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of development on nine and we kind of just found out about the development behind us. And then to the west of 30s, there's this whole big apartment complex. Um, I was here for um, something going on on the south side of 9. And now we found out about this today from one of our neighbors who reads all the paper, a little blurb about this event going on. Um, when they do developments, are any neighbor next door notified of this? Yes, I believe so, Mr. Whitehouse. Correct. So we, in terms of postcard notifications, they go out to all property owners within 200 feet of the parcel boundary. So if you live over here to the northeast, that would be more than 200 feet away. But we do notice in the local newspaper, and we do place physical posting on the site itself. And it is also displayed on county's website and also the, the press notifications go to multiple newspapers. Okay. So the answer is you wouldn't have received a postcard okay. if you lived that far away. And our, and our owner wouldn't have been notified. I mean, we're taking over now, but Insight here, would not have been notified. If, they, if Insight owned this parcel here, then this owner, which is, I understand, the developer, Yes. Should, and I, I can verify that. Well, just, it'll take me a minute, but in theory, because that parcel's within 200 feet, it should have gone to that address there on the screen. So. Okay. We weren't notified. Okay. okay. Um, then the main thing I wanted to say, living there, and I've been in there oh, just over six years, 
even from Hawthorne, in the, particularly in the morning night, because I'm with my sister and she works, it can take 15, 20 minutes to get out of our community, 15 minutes to get in. 30 from uh, 9 backs up past Hawthorne. And putting more homes right next door, right in that between 30, and I, I just don't understand how they can condense so much. And I'm opposed, so. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Or? No. To confirm, uh, we did send written notification to that adjoining parcel with the address shown on the screen, so they did get a postcard. I will. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Is there any? Good afternoon. You have Chris Stuklick, 4430 Pinewood Court, Brownsburg, Indiana. Uh, four six one one two. Uh, before I start, um, I sent email using the application at the county site to Mr. Riley and to Tracy Torbert, and um, in that I may have used a wrong map number. I may have substituted one two three where I should have used one three five. So my apologies for that. Um, I am the landowner of parcel sixty two. Point oh two, uh, just west and adjacent to the parcel in question for development, parcel 65. And I'm speaking for owners of 6201, David Williams, Duclick, and then 6203, Jonathan Todd Stuclick. Um, again, all three adjacent to the parcel in question. Um, the and I'm a Sussex County native currently living in Indiana. I plan to return to Sussex County as I've recently retired. Um, the land that we own goes back roughly 120 years. We're descendants of the Copel family. Uh, you may know Copel's name, notice Copel's name on the tax ditches in the area. And that that family owned uh, all the land around the intersection of Gravel Hill Road and Route 9 at one time and several properties uh, radiating in all directions from there. Um, when I was being, when I grew up on parcel 60, I think it's 61, um, at that time there were five, uh, five households in Gravel Hill that were all family members. Um, my concern with the development and the proposal stems mostly from the site plan that I've seen on the planning and zoning packet uh, where it seems to eliminate the trees on the property for the most part anyway. And those trees are primarily located behind the parcels in question, uh, the parcels I'm representing. And so there's a concern with that and the change in the character of the neighborhood uh, by doing that. But then also uh, concerns with the exterior lighting that would be present in the development and potentially with the noise. Um, our plans for the properties that we own have not been determined. Uh, personal uses, development for personal use is a possibility. They're currently not developed. Um, they were leased out as agricultural land for some period of time until maybe 15, roughly 15 years ago. And at that time, we decided to let the natural growth take place. Uh, with the expectation that we'd have healthy trees at some point in time. And so we're in progress on that. Uh, but the possibilities are personal use and also um, sale. We have received offers. We have not marketed the properties. But we have received offers, but obviously we haven't um, followed up on any of those or accepted any of those. So the concerns are with the loss of trees uh, between the properties that we own and the proposed development and then the aesthetics and potential loss of uh, property value that we would experience. And those are my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stukely. Is there anyone else, operator? To, to confirm At this Mr. time, there are no additional callers on the line. Okay, thank you. To confirm, Mr. Lord, Mr. Stukely's comments have been received and they are in the record. That is an additional That's comment. That's the one I was referring okay. to. So, yes. Okay, thank you. At this time, Mr. President, we can close the public hearing. Council desires close the public record. Close the public hearing. Okay, the council close the public record. Mr. Moore, if you would read the first short title. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. 
uh, an ordinance to amend the future land use map of the comprehensive plan in relation to tax parcel 135-11.00-65.00. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, I would like to defer on this one for uh, a week or two. I think we reconvene in two weeks and give us a chance to review some of what we heard today. Okay, motion, Mr. Riley, to defer. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Hudson. Any questions on the motion? We'll take the vote, Mr. Shaver. Yes. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Riley. Yes. Abel, yes. Next, Mr. Moore. Yes.